Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 11th of May, 2017, and today we have a special guest here. This is Alan Cavedo, who is also known as Rallin Man online. There you go. That's welcome, right. Welcome, Alan. Thank you. Glad uh, to be here. It's good to have you here. Um, I brought Alan on because I think it's really helpful to have multiple perspectives. Alan does some production sound work. Um, he showed me a couple of the pieces that he's worked on. I don't know if, we're, if you'd like. I can link to anything in the show notes here, Alan, once we're done. Um, we, but we can look at that. Okay, good. And uh, he's going to help. Uh, we're going to we're going to have a little bit of a dialogue today. We had uh, a variety of questions submitted, so let's go ahead and jump in. The first one is from Hazem. Uh, hello, Curtis. Keep up the good work. Would you please make a comparison between the Zoom F8 and the Sound Devices Mix Pre Six? So, neither of us have actually worked with the Mix Pre. Um, in any sort of serious capacity yet. I have had, I've seen it at NAB, but we haven't seen it yet. So we're going to caveat this. But let's go right. ahead and first, uh, Alan, why don't you go ahead and give us your impressions so far from what we know. Well, he, uh, he said F8, right? Uh, yeah, Zoom F8 and Mix Pre 6. Okay, well, first off, the Mix Pre 6 has four preamp, full function preamp inputs, and the Zoom F8 has eight. Mm -hmm. So, that, you know, advantage F8. Um, I would bet, uh, $10 that the preamps in the Mix uh, Pre 6 probably would outperform the F8 Pre's, but um, I've seen some arguing back and forth on that exact topic, mm -hmm. and the, if you look at the numbers, they're pretty close. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think when, they're, when you're competing at that level of performance, maybe you really can't hear the difference unless you push it to the extreme. So, But you have, you have more. You have twice as many preamps in the F8, so that's one thing. Mm -hmm. F8 also has a time code generator, which uh, is a distinct advantage, although I think it is rather ingenious how the uh, Mix Pre 6 and the Mix Pre 3 have been designed to take in time code and mm -hmm. put it in metadata and put it in the files and, and handle it. So you're not having to pay for the typical sound device's internal ambient um, uh, time code generator, which I don't know what they pay for those circuit boards, but it's got to be hundreds of dollars. So mm -hmm. they've kept that cost out. Um, let's see. So also the Mix Pre 6 um, has analog limiters, as yes. does the Mix Pre 3. Big deal. And as you've shown in your videos, uh, testing directly with the F8, I think it was the F8, mm -hmm. when you do your classic Curtis Judd screaming, <laughs> it's... Uh, <laughs> It, you you definitely proved a point, and I could and I ran that video several times. I actually ran it for friends of mine, um, and I ran it in class that I taught, and you could hear it. Uh, I know we had that one fellow who who couldn't quite hear it, maybe, but anyway, I I, uh, I think definite advantage goes to Sound Devices Mix Pre Six for the analog limiters. However, as you uh, heard from Paul Isaacs, and also I've heard it elsewhere that they designed the input system to be almost technical engineer free because they have so much dynamic range and they have such a quiet low noise floor he, uh, he made the claim that you don't need to worry about the uh, analog limiter so much you've got you can have a ton of headroom like 15 16 db of headroom and you won't have any problem pulling it up in post because you won't have a noise floor yeah. Yeah. but still i like a good analog limiter um, so i would say advantage mix pre six on that um, I think the probably the um, ergonomics of the Mix Pre 6 might be an ad, an advantage over the F8. I have never used an F8. I know it is tiny. Mm -hmm. I've considered buying one a couple of times as a backup to my uh, 788T, but I never have done that. Um, but I think people who get used to the tiny controls on the little screen, I think they do just fine with it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure there's a I'm not sure there's an advantage either way there. It's just what you get used to. Yep. Yep. So um, uh, oh, now let's see. Then there's the price. So you're yep. talking about the same price, mm -hmm. aren't you? Yep. It's maybe only fifty or seventy dollars difference. Yep. So so here's a question. Here's a practical question. Um, you have you have considered purchasing an F8 multiple times in the past. Um, mm -hmm. Pretty soon here the Mix Pre's will be shipping. Are you going to buy one or the other? Um. Yes. Right now I'm considering the Mix Pre 3 okay. because um, I've got a 
I gave myself a Christmas present. Well, actually, Santa Claus brought a Christmas present. <laughs> it's a, uh, a Lumix um, FZ2500. Okay, yep. It's a kind of a crossover or what they, you know, it's a built-in lens and all that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And my requirement was I wanted to have a camera, and I looked at all of them. I wanted a, I wanted a, a A6500, mm-hmm. um, but I had to have a headphone output. Being a sound guy, I had to have a mic in and a headphone out. I just, and I know recording audio to the camera, it's not ideal. But as I've said to you before, um, gain stage things properly. It's amazing what you can accomplish. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got that camera and I put my mix pre D on it. Mm-hmm. And I can do wonderful things with that setup, but I have to record the audio into the camera. But with a Mix Pre 3 being very small, I can screw it onto the bottom of my camera and more or less leave it there and have dual system sound Mm -hmm. and also feed the output into the the mic input on the camera. So I can have reference audio there or just roll with it if it sounds good enough. Mm -hmm. Um, If things get crazy, people start screaming or it's loud sound effects or whatever, I can always roll back to the double system sound and and take that in. So... Mm -hmm. That's what I'm looking at now, um, yep. and uh, I have a tendency when I'm confused with a choice, I just get both of them. <laughs> so <laughs> that's that's a great position to be in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll see. I, I, and just to, uh, the reason I asked that question, I think that's telling. Um, you know, not necessarily. It's not your situation is not necessarily the same as, as anyone else's, but that's a telling piece of information. And, and for those that are curious, I, I have a Mix Pre 6 on pre-order, so I do plan to get one of those. Um, mm-hmm. I already have a Zoom F8. I have a Zoom F4. Um, I, you know, there are a variety of reasons I'm doing it. Part of it is that I, um, you know, as part of my production here, I, I review those types of things. So that's part of the reason I'm purchasing it, of course. But sure. um, I think the feature set to me is quite compelling. Um, and it is a little bit different than the Zoom F series. Um, I think they they kind of they poured most of their efforts into the preamplifiers and the analog limiters, mm-hmm. and um, actually some some of the audio interface features as well. So you can actually use it as an audio interface and record at the same time, which you cannot do with the F series. Um, oh, okay. So, I thought you could too. Oh, I'm thinking of the zooms. Never mind. Yeah. I mean the um, the smaller zooms. Yeah. So it's. Um, and even on the smaller zooms, I think once you're in audio interface mode, you're not recording to the recorder at the same time. Oh, you're time. right. You're so. right. Paul Isaacs did say that. It's the only one. The Mix yeah. Pre 6 and 3 is the only one out there that will do both yep. at the same time. Yep. Yep. So it's an interesting, it's just a very interesting feature set that I think, um, I think they thought through it very carefully. Um, what I'm very excited about is I like to see this competition. I like to see now we have Zoom in the market, mm-hmm. in the you know thousand dollar and under market, and we have sound right. devices in the thousand dollar and under market. So I yeah. think we're going to see a little bit of innovation that's going to be good for everybody here. So I think you're right. And what really excites me, even beyond the Mix Pre series, is that the new um, Cashmere preamp and some of their design philosophy, the uh, the, the case that they made, the uh, cast aluminum case and, and all that, and the, and the touch color touch screen, those are all big leaps forward for sound devices. And so I, I can't help but think, wow, <laughs> what are they going to do with their pro line? Yeah. What's going to replace the 788? What, what will they incorporate into what's coming? So I, I see a big future with these guys. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It looks interesting. All right. Well, that's a, that was a good one. Thanks for that one. We have our next question here from Alex. Um, Alex, I'm going to go ahead and summarize your question, but you essentially are going to be running, um, let's see here, uh, Blackmagic Design Ursa Mini Pro and uh, Sony, a couple of Sony A7 cameras. And your question was, you know, what, what should I do for capturing sound since I'm going to be the single operator? So you don't have a dedicated sound guy. So Alan, what's your first thought when you, when you hear something like that? Well, I, I, I don't want to come across as a shill for sound devices, but uh, I do own a lot of the, their equipment because I've been acquiring it over the last five, six years. Mm-hmm. Um, just because, and I have to say, I, the only thing I bought new was the 788T. Everything else I bought on eBay or from other sound mixers. So almost mm-hmm. all of it has been purchased at well below retail in the used market. So mm-hmm. um, I would say... 
the Mix Pre 3 would be ideal for all of those cameras. And um, not having one of those, I would say look at a Mix Pre D, which has been around for a number of years. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of more of a pro unit in a way. It's got XLRs in, XLRs out. It's got um, you know, some features that that you, that the Mix Pre 3 doesn't have because that's kind of a prosumer device mm -hmm. um, by design. And the I think you can pick up a Mix Pre D for it. Well, the problem is it they're not that inexpensive. I think they're still used. They're six hundred to seven fifty mm -hmm. thereabouts. Yep. Yep. Um, so that I think gives you a good base of equipment to to work a lot of magic uh, audio magic um, from microphones of all types and get good sound into your camera uh, or get good sound into double system if you go with the Mix Pre Three. I don't think you can beat that price of six fifty for something like that. Yep. I mean, unless you go markedly down. Now, another solution would be to use some of the more sophisticated powered video mics from Rode um, and um, others. I mean, there's the there's the Video Mic Pro, there's the Video Mic Mini. Uh, I think it was called or Micro. I have both of those. Mm -hmm. There's the stereo one that you tested. Yep. There's one that. Uh, Watson Wu loves it's that eight hundred dollar ball looking thing, oh, right. spherical so stereo junk. video mic X. I think it's called. Yes, yep. that that looks really nice. Um, those kind of units now, now that particular one costs more than a Mix Pre three, <laughs> um, but it's got the advantage of being mountable on the hot shoe, mm -hmm. and it, it's a you know a nice rig for that. I don't know if that Ursa Mini has a hot shoe. Uh, it does not. It does yeah. not. Yeah. No. But but it has all so, the quarter twenties. You could mount one up there if you you could sure. Out. Yeah. yeah. So I would say from one of those two schools of thought, mm -hmm. get a preamp system slash recorder possibly bolted onto the bottom of the camera, mm -hmm. or go with one of the more sophisticated powered uh, video mics. They can be fairly effective. But they are mounted on the camera, and you can't get them out on the end of a boom too easily. I mean, I've seen you do it, and I actually have done it with my Video Mic Pro. I bought the little extension cord and all that. But, mm -hmm. And it is effective, but um, I, I just think you can't go wrong if you buy yourself a piece of gear that is a preamp slash recorder. Um, like they say, uh, buy once, cry once. Right, exactly. <laughs> and I think... Uh I would agree. The Mix Pre 3 seems to me, I would actually, versus the Mix Pre D, I would actually, as a single operator, um, if you're focused on, you know, operating camera, I'd probably, yeah. my bias would be for a Mix Pre 3 because they're, they are simpler to operate, I think. Yeah. Um, and, you, and you have that huge wide range of input, right. trouble free, don't even have to adjust it. Mm -hmm. Just worry about the camera. Yep. You know? Yep. The only, the only downside with the Mix Pre 3 and 6 that I see, uh, well, depending on the situation that it has an unbalanced output, um, is that a big issue? If it's mounted to the camera, probably not. You can adapt that to XLR, and it's probably going to be just fine. You're not going to pick up interference, yeah. most likely. No, so no, uh, fine. yeah, that, that's not really a concern. You're talking about a uh, you know 12 to 18 inch cable. That's not going to be much of an antenna. Yeah, yeah. So that'll probably work well. And I agree. I think the Rode Video Mic Pro. I am just amazed at what that thing can capture and produce. It actually can do a very, very nice job. So I think for your Sony A7 series cameras, that makes a lot of sense to put something like a Rode Video Mic Pro on those. And then, you know, if you want to have, if you want to kind of up the, the quality for your Ursa Mini, which has XLR inputs, then, um, you know, you could also do a, a Rode Video Mic Pro into that if you wanted to keep it that simple, but you could also add the Mix Pre 3 to that along with a proper boom pole or, or wireless or whatever it is you're going to do, so. Is that Ursa the camera that has the AES inputs? Um, only the the Pro version. So. Oh, okay. Ah, look at that. That's mm -hmm. the, the new version there, and it does have the AES inputs. Um, so in that case, if you were gonna, you know, if you're gonna get really fancy, you'd probably have to move. You'd have to move it to something like the 633 to get AES out. Well, into something not like exactly. No. Mix Pre D. Ah, okay. That's where the Mix that, Pre D comes in. Okay. That's one of the pro features I was talking about that it has that the uh, Mix Pre Three does not have. Okay. See. Or the Mix Pre Six. Alan was asking why I invited him on the show. <laughs> yeah. Now we know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> there we go. Very good. All right. Well, let's let's move on to our next one here. Our next one is from Steve. Steve had a question. And Steve, I will confess up front, I don't know the answer to this. I think I do. So I need to do a little bit more research. Um, and I apologize. I wasn't able to do that before the show here. But you're talking about processing your audio in Adobe Audition. You do the loudness normalization. Um, your peaks are still, you know, true peak below minus one dB or wherever you have them set. But once you bring them back over into Premiere, you're getting some clipping. I think it has to do with the the pan loss setting in Adobe Audition. I'm not positive on that, but I need to check that. So I'll get back to you on that. But Alan, you had a suggestion as well that I thought was a good one. Yeah, well, I was first kind of, I mean, we have Premiere uh, and Audition here, although we've rarely used it. We're just, we're, we do some video editing, but not that often. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, but I do realize that Premiere and Audition are connected. So mm -hmm. you can bounce from one to the other and it maintains time code and all that kind of thing, which is great which made me wonder well, what's going wrong because it, the audio level should be consistent, I would think, between both environments. So I agree with you. There must be something set off maybe on the Premiere side. But um, I have done a lot of post in my days um, when I was recording live musical performances. Uh, and I have uh, been – I've always used um, uh, PreSonus's Studio One – Pro, and I bought the Pro because it has a built-in mastering system. And uh, one of the things I always did was, on the mixing side, I always had a limiter set to minus 1 dB on the final output. So the stereo output, no matter how many channels you've got, the stereo output, put a limiter on there, set it to minus 1 dB. Mm -hmm. And I also did the same thing on the um, mastering side, because if you master and you add EQ and you do various things, you can build up the gain to the point where you're exceeding uh, what you took in. So again, a minus one dB limiter acts as a nice safety valve. It prevents you from uh, blowing your render, because if you have a clip and render, it'll stop and tell you that it, you had a fault. So it prevents that. And, and typically, you're not going to be clipping, you're not going to be limiting but just a dB or two or three, something like that, typically. Mm -hmm maybe at most four or five, but not 10 or 20. So it's not going to really change the the sound of what you've recorded uh, much at all, if at all. Um, and you tend to learn. It takes away the fear in, in a lot of cases. Um, you know you have that safety valve there, so you don't worry about it too much, but you do learn, oh, I'm, oh I see uh, 12 dB of limiting going on. I think I probably have my gains too high in the mix side. So you, it teaches you to go mix differently and more correctly without blowing your renders. Yep. So it's a good thing to have in there. Yep, yep. Good advice. I agree. Um, but we will get back to you with a, you know, we'll try and do a little bit more work on that and see what may be going on there. I didn't realize this. Um, there is another question that Steve asked, and that is when I'm editing my audio track in Audition, I have been using the fill right with left effect and then edit the audio with both left and right channels, producing a final stereo audio track with the same dialogue in both left and right channels. Wondering if this is the correct process. Well, it's not stereo. It's the same signal in left and right. Mm -hmm. So it's dual mono, really. Right. Um, I, I guess it depends if you, where you want your dialogue to show up. And if you're producing a stereo mix output, whether you pan it or have left and right with the same signal, the, the net result is it's in the center. Mm -hmm. So uh, typically dialogue you want in the center, unless you're doing a more sophisticated uh, release where you're going to actually track the actors across the screen with your panning, mm -hmm. which they do that in Hollywood. They do that in the big films. Uh, I guess that's about all I could say at this point. I agree. I agree. I think for most, um, certainly in my corporate video work, I'm I'm mostly just pay, I'm just in the center. So I have the same thing on the left and right channels, dual mono, mm -hmm. and we call it good. Um, our clients aren't paying enough to, <laughs> for the for the fancy, um, you know, tracking the tracking the actor or the talent across the screen, and they're not generally right. moving across the screen anyway. So, right. Um, I think. Uh, in fact, of all the things I've done, I've done about forty, uh, a little over forty productions. Mm -hmm of some sort or another. I've never once been asked for a stereo mix. However, I have given them stereo mixes they didn't ask for. Yeah. 
yeah. just because I like the way it sounded. But you know, you, typically they don't. They're not really even aware of it. Yeah, yeah. And and by stereo, I mean like if we're doing dialogue outside of a house, mm-hmm. I will run an amb- a stereo ambience track in the recorder, like from a stereo microphone, mm-hmm. uh, and um, I've got a stereo shotgun, I've got a stereo XY mic. And I'll just record that, and sometimes I'll mix it in a little bit. So instead of having birds chirping and bees buzzing and that kind of thing, totally dead center mono, it's an actual stereo ambience, which fills out the sound nicely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good, good. All right. Thank you for that question, Steve. Next one up is from Trevor. Uh, Let's see here. In your previous segments, you did not recommend pairing the NTG2 with the H4N due to high gain requirements of the NTG2 shotgun microphone and the H4N audio recorder. Um, Due to the lower quality of the preamps in the H4N, would you make the same statement about pairing the Rode NTG2 shotgun mic with the H4N Pro audio recorder? Yeah, I think that's probably worth investigating. Um, I used to own an H4N. I have used it successfully in actual productions as kind of a hidden recorder mic or a, uh, a special purpose, special function kind of utility recorder when I had to have more than one recorder on the, on the set. Mm-hmm. And um, thankfully, there were no real high-end pro sound guys there because there was <laughs> no one there to laugh at me, which I appreciated. Um, the H4N takes a lot of guff you know, from the pro guys. Uh, they're always cutting it down. But what I found was if you gain stage it properly, it can work very well. Mm-hmm. Um, I never had a problem with the dynamics or noise floor or anything like that because although it's a little noisy in the preamp side, there's almost always more ambient noise than there is noise floor. Mm-hmm. So it's masked and it's not really that important. So, but it's true. I think the gain on the H4N is what, 57 or something? Not even that. I think it's uh, It's, more in the 54, 53, 54 uh, range. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think that the new pro version, they added, and I can't remember, I'm just working from memory. I think it was six or seven more dB maybe, Mm -hmm. Um, maybe a few more dB than that. So I would say it's probably worth a look. I don't think it costs that much more. Um, However, I did sell my um, H4N, and I got I replaced it with a Tascam DR100 Mark II, which um, is the same form factor, basically. Mm-hmm. It's two channels only. It's not four channels like the H4N is. But um, I just wanted that because it has better preamp performance and all. Well, now, that has been replaced with the Mark III, which has a magnesium frame and all this. So they've really proified that thing up quite a bit Mm -hmm. um, probably more so than the h4n pro but i would say take a look at both of those yeah Uh, not the mark three unless you really want a heavy duty unit go with the mark two it's a i think they sell for i don't know was it 250 or something like that or less i think the same price as h4n so yeah Take a look at those two. Yeah, that's definitely good. Um, I did a review of the H4N Pro, and we actually did use the NTG2 with that um, with that recorder. And my finding was that with the NTG2, you get a pretty good signal, and the noise floor oh, good. wasn't really offensive. So I think it's a fine combination. Good deal. Um, I would also consider, uh, you know, just as you said, Alan, I would consider the Tascam offerings as well. Um, those of you that have followed for a while know I'm actually pretty enthusiastic about the Tascam DR60D Mark II. Mm-hmm. Um, right. That one was, seemed a little bit cleaner to me than the H4N. Um, I didn't ever test it against the H4N Pro, but you know, in any case, I uh, the thing I liked about the Tascam DR60D Mark II is that even with a dynamic microphone, you could get a, a good signal, a good clean recording without uh, fighting with the noise floor. So take that for what it's worth. I'll put a link for the the review of the H4N Pro where we have the recording with the NTG2. Sure. So you Sounds can see good. That. All right. Trevor, thanks for that one. Moving on here, we next have a question from Jack. All right. Jack is uh, doing some recording um, with uh, mainly live bands using the Zoom F8. I'm just going to paraphrase here. Um, he had a question about when he was setting up the band, he would use the gain trim knobs to, to gain stage, to set the gain up correctly, or to, to, to you know sort of adapt to the amount of 
sound pressure that each of the instruments was producing into their microphones. Mm -hmm. um, and then once he started recording, um, he was under the impression that he should use to, he should switch to the mode where the potentiometers or the knobs became faders so that he could, uh, you know, do some mixing. And the question is, is, is that the correct way to do it? So Alan, what's your thought on that? Well, again, I don't have an H, uh, I, I mean, a four, uh, an eight, what is it? A F8, sorry, I don't have an F8, but but I've done a lot of reading on them. I've looked at them, and um, it's funny. There's an interesting correspondence between that unit and the sound devices 788T that I do have, mm -hmm. because the 788T has the same sort of setup internally. It has eight little knobs on the front, mm -hmm. like the uh, F8 does, and the default is they act as gain knobs. Mm -hmm. But you can also go in the menu and you can change it to be a fader. Um, you can also buy a fader surface and hook it on there and have both, mm -hmm. as you can with the F8, with that external unit. Yeah, you've, you've got that, right? Yeah, okay, that thing. <laughs> now, the deal is, and I, I went through this same kind of orientation when I was sort of getting used to the whole concept, the difference between a gain knob and a fader knob it i mean frankly it took me a while to kind of get it so to speak um but if, if you're recording if you were going to record eight iso tracks because you're recording a band and you need all eight preamps to yeah. pick up just describe what's an iso track just to be oh yep. okay yeah an isolated track that means that you you have eight preamp inputs the recorder can record eight separate digital audio tracks, mm -hmm. one per input. Yep. So, and you can change the gain on any channel and it, they're totally separate. And when you, and it produces a file, a WAV file that has all eight tracks embedded in one file. Mm -hmm. So when you pull it out into a post uh, situation, a, a audition or, or whatever you're using, um, you will see all eight tracks in that one file. Uh, so if you're gonna record a band my advice is, and this is what I learned, consider those knobs to be gain controls only. Do not worry about the fader. Make sure all the faders are set at zero, which is unity gain. Doesn't subtract, doesn't add mm -hmm. uh, in signal strength. So you do not need faders when you're recording a band unless you're streaming a stereo mix to say a live feed web broadcast or a radio feed or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, or if somebody asked you to on site right there, mix up a stereo mix and hand off a, a SD card to somebody. Yeah. Now I can tell you that's not going to be very useful because it's very difficult to do a mix like that for a band on site. Mm -hmm. Um, that that's a whole nother level of skill that I don't know anything about. <laughs> it's hard enough to do it in post when you have days to do it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, plus, you have no effects, you have no compression, no you know EQ, no, none of that. So it's not really worthwhile. The fader system is to be used primarily when you're recording dialogue from multiple talents on a set or in a production, and you have to produce a mix right then and there to go into the camera or to go and be used for dailies when you play it back for the directors, or to feed into a ComTech RF broadcast into headphones so that the script supervisor and the director and all those guys can hear what's going on. You've got eight mics out there on eight actors. You do have to mix that, because mm -hmm. you can't just leave eight mics open while one person or two persons are speaking. That's when you do the fading and the mixing. Mm -hmm. But I would suggest you don't do any fading or mixing in a live musical recording. I agree, hundred percent. Now, if again, if you need, if you need for some reason that stereo mix, then yeah, let's talk. That's when you would need to switch it over into fader mode um, or use something like the F control, which we showed you before. Um, but if you don't need that, then I agree, you're better off focusing on the isolated tracks making sure that you have those properly gain staged, that nothing's clipping in any of the individual channels, and enjoy the show. <laughs> and, and don't forget, when you ask the band to give you a loud a little yeah. few seconds to set your gain, uh, they will never play as loud as they're going to play. Yep. 
So uh, you may think they're playing loud, but they're not. Go ahead and set your gains a little lower. Give yourself a little more headroom because they will eventually blow out all of your headroom uh, if you're not careful. Absolutely. And, and you know, that, that applies to dialogue, too. I don't know if you've noticed that as well. Same yeah, thing. I've I've asked actors many times. Like, give me all you got. Let me hear, let me let me give me your worst, and they'll <laughs> yeah 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 you know. But then when it really gets going, it's much louder. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, very good. Thanks for that one. Next one up is from J H Book Brooks. Um, Thanks as always for your continued informative webcasts. I am sometimes pressed into recording a two-person interview show alone. Typically, my setup is three cameras: one center, two shot. One on the guest, one on the host, and a boom stand with a single Audio Technica AT875R shotgun microphone into either a Zoom H4N or a Tascam DR60D for for um, audio. The mic is usually placed closer to the softer speaking person to try and balance the sound levels between the two people. Though the mic is placed as close as possible without being in frame of the center shot, I still get some unwanted room echo. An area carpet is usually placed underneath the set of the two chairs and a small table. Unfortunately, I don't have lobs yet. Any other thoughts or recommendations? You first, Alan. (laughs) Yeah, okay. Well, it doesn't say how the talent are arranged. Um, Are they across the table from each other? Are they next to each other on one side of the table so cameras can see both? Mm -hmm. Um, So I would say a couple things. Um, My first inclination is to say, get a second shotgun mic, a second boom, and a second stand, and position them appropriately so they cancel each other out, you know, 90 degrees, you know, so that, you know, you're looking, you're you're listening to each talent individually Mm -hmm. with good cancellation between the two mics. Um, That mic model number, I don't think is that expensive. Of course, I, I, you know, you're always very careful to, to not... You know, to to have respect for anyone's budget because everybody has different budgets. So, yep. I would agree with that concept. Um, I can't say go buy another boom mic, but I, that would be the the best answer. Mm-hmm. Um, another possible solution would be, and I've done this myself a number of times. Um, don't use a shotgun mic. Use cardioid mic, and you have a wider pickup pattern. Mm-hmm. In fact, when I'm booming two talent on a the camera they're both in the same shot normally on interiors i'll use the um sennheiser mkh 8050 which is a a super cardioid and but if it's two actors talking to each other i will switch mics and use the 8040 which is a cardioid mic Mm -hmm. and then i don't have to cue the mic like this on every utterance a lot of times i can go straight down the middle Mm -hmm. and the lobe the lobe picks up both talent equally well. Mm -hmm. Now, if they're across the table, that won't work. And there is something to be said for what he, for what he said, you know, putting the mic closer to the louder person. I've actually done that too, uh, with a boom. Mm -hmm. Um, but you will pick up more of the room. Uh, I I said, position it to the, the, not the loudest person, position it farther away from the loudest person. But, you will pick up room acoustics that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and should he use a lav? Getting into lavs is a whole other can of worms. I mean, they're good, and they, but they take a lot of knowledge how to position them unless they let you clip them on, like in a, a 60 minutes type situation mm-hmm. where it's visible. Yep. Um, then you have the, how do you hook the lav into the recorder? Because lavs are typically hooked into a transmitter. Um, you can do it. You have to buy additional accessory devices that add cost. So if you look at all of it, I would say go with another mic mm-hmm. um, and take a look at using um, supercardioids or hypercardioids rather than a shotgun mm-hmm. mic on an interior. Mm-hmm. That's I always use. I always do not use a shotgun unless it's a very acoustically stable environment no no reverb very little reverb no echo Mm -hmm. that kind of thing yeah i agree i agree i think that the most bang for your buck is going to be a second microphone um ideally not a shotgun mic but um you know this may be a good time to invest in a um, a cardioid of some sort that is without the um 
interference tube design, so without the shotgun right. design on it. Right. Um, but if, you know, I think, yeah, it really depends. I think the, the trick is, is that um, even with a cardioid that you, st you position over the two people, um, you're still going to pick up some, some room tone, you know, all the, the reflections and the echo and the reverb and all that, you're still going to get that even, you know, because it sounds like your constraint here is the two shot is relatively wide. And uh, so that means you're going to have to move that microphone or those microphones up a little bit higher. So I think that um, something that's more directional and having two of them, one on each person, is probably going to be the best result. Um, and I agree that lav mics come with a whole host of issues, and they're not necessarily cheaper. In fact, they, you know, right. if you're gonna, especially if you're going wireless, they're definitely not cheaper. <laughs> so. Right. And and something else to consider, you get a lot of slap back off of a flat table surface. Mm -hmm. So if... Mm -hmm. If the table is in the shot, well, not much you can do about it, except maybe put a tablecloth on it if that would work, although typically it doesn't. They, the producers don't want to see that. Right. But if the table is not in the shot, put a ferny blanket or an actual sound blanket on top of the mm -hmm. um, table, and you'd be amazed at the clearly audible increase in quality you'll get by doing that. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Well, good. I hope that provides you some ideas there. That's a, that's a good one. We're moving on to our next one here from David. Uh, thank you, as always, for putting out such great material. I enjoyed your dialogue post-processing series very much and was wondering if you have a similar set of steps you regularly employ for working with recorded live music. So just for your benefit, Alan, in my dialogue post-processing course, we talked about um, you know, all the processing steps for cleaning up audio, dialogue audio, um, EQing, um, high-pass filtering, uh, de-reverbing if you need to do that, you know, all these different steps you use and then loudness normalizing at the end. So there is a variety of things we talked about. Do you have a similar process for working with live, uh, live music's recordings? Yeah, I've, I've recorded bands with like 16 members, you know, brass and a full drum kit, the, the whole deal, a live singer, um, and I've had, I would go on site with my PreSonus racks and I had, I could record the 24 channels on site, at, you know, live. Um, I don't think I ever did 24, but I did do 16 a number of times. Yeah. Um, and the main thing I would do is just make sure I had mics fairly close in on the instruments. Like I would put one mic in between each, like two trumpets would get one mic because I didn't have all those mics you know that i needed at that time right. um uh put one mic in between the two saxophones put one mic in front of the the uh the singer put probably two four six probably six mics on the drum kit and and i'm recording in like a in a church activity room with a linoleum floor and a hard you know well at least had acoustic ceiling uh, uh -huh. or in in a moose lodge with again the linoleum floor and the paneled walls and you know low ceiling terrible acoustic environments i mean it, the worst i ever did was recording a high school marching band in the gym <laughs> i had 12 mics out there scattered amongst those kids and uh, huge reverb uh, the decay in there was like six seconds oh wow yeah well so at that point you just sort of embrace it and make it an effect right <laughs> well it's I I did a lot of work in post, and in all these cases that I'm uh, reminiscing on here, it was always a lot of work in post. In the case of the gym, you know, I would actually fade up and fade down with automation to knock out the reverb when it was totally obvious, and mm -hmm. I would open up section mics to uh, bring in sections of the band when they were playing and pull them out when they weren't playing to cut down on the cacophony that you were getting on all these channels. Mm -hmm. So same thing, recording live, um, tr try to get your mics fairly close in, not totally close in because you want to get a little bit of air mm -hmm. between the instrument face and the mic. Um, and then just work the tricks you can work with compression and EQ and mixing and automation in your post environment. Um, spent days, and in fact, I got to tell you, it's the days in post that got me out of live recording of musical performances <laughs> and into production sound actor dialogue recording because you experienced because, the pain yeah it just you know it was 
it was a one I was a one man band dragging all that equipment in there to the venue to record the band and then he was running snakes and cables every which way and mm -hmm. working up a huge sweat and then finally they're like tapping their fingers are you going to be done here soon so we can start playing you know and it's just me so that drove me nuts and then I spend a week in post getting it mixed up that drove me crazy mm -hmm. I never knew when I was done yeah um yeah and so you could do in production sound, you show up, you record the talent, end of the day you hand the guy the CF card or the SD card and you're done. You get paid, you walk away, and it's a beautiful thing. And you get to That's see what, the, the amazing results, uh, you know, however long down the road uh, when they when post finishes and, they, and it goes to broadcast. That, that's or true. Whatever. Yeah. And more often than not, almost every single time I was amazed at what they could do in post with my audio. Yeah. yeah. You know, they're so good. Most of the guys are so good. Absolutely. I, and I agree. The only thing I would say is just to clarify, for those that are not familiar with the, the term automation, we haven't talked a lot about that. Um, what automation, what you're referring to, what Alan's referring to is that when you're doing a mix, say, for example, you're in Adobe Audition and you're mixing all the different tracks together, you have a trumpet track, you have a drum kit tracks or multiple tracks for the drum kit and you know, so on and so forth. Um, automation is when you take the fader for each channel and you either pull it down or push it back up to choose how much of that instrument or that track ends up in the final mix. And so right. um, this is very similar to the a thing we talked about a few weeks ago where when you're doing an interview, for example, you might do some active mixing where you're pulling the fader down to the person that's not talking so that you're not yep. getting the mic bleed and you're not getting the room sound. And then you you know you go back and forth as the people talk. So... That's yep. what that concept's all about. So good. Okay, right. great, David. Good question. Thanks for that. Our next one here is, let's see, Greg Palmer. These are the last two, I believe. And Greg had two questions, both of them pretty good. Um, one was a stumper, and this is a post question. Uh, Greg asks, in regards to Isotope RX-6, how do you see denoise dialog, denoise spectral, and dialog isolate tools working? Just using one of them or some combination for normal interview audio. So RX is, um, have you used RX before, Alan? I have not, but of course I have gone through every single video of RX-5 and RX-6 because it's <laughs> totally fascinating. And I have almost pulled the trigger on the Pro version at least 27 times. Yep. Yep. And I stopped myself from doing it because I'll be back into post. <laughs> so... Um, I think it's a good question, um, and to be honest, Greg, I have not dug into the spectral denoising and the um, the dialogue isolate tools as much yet, so I have some more homework to do on that before I can really give you a good question there. I think the dialogue denoiser is, is tuned. Um, I think it has some actual, um, something in its algorithm is, is able to recognize dialogue, and human voice. Human voice, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's able mm -hmm. to take some of it's able to use that as a sort of a starting point to d decide what is noise and what is not. So I think that has an influence on the algorithm it's using there. So I think um, my initial thought is that that's probably going to be the most effective for um, you know if you're processing interview audio, um, and I think that the spectral denoise is going to be more useful when you have um, discontinuous noises that have interrupted the interview. Right, like somebody blowing a whistle or something, you can pull those out. Right, cell phone ringing, I, whatever that may be. Right. In general, I would say it's probably an 80-20 rule, maybe, in that you get 80% of the effectiveness of one tool chosen wisely up front. Mm -hmm. And then additional tools can be added to pull out that 20% that remains mm -hmm. or close to it. Yep. That's just a guess, but that's kind of the way it is with a lot of audio Agreed. Uh, systems. Agreed. Now the dialogue isolate tool is an interesting one. I have just I just started playing with that one, and this one it allows you to do is control how much of the dialogue you want to keep or or not, and likewise with the ambiance. Um, so that's an interesting one. I'll have to play with that one a little bit more. The effect I was getting with the particular clip of audio I was working with was it, it wasn't doing the same thing that dialogue denoise does. It was it almost seemed like more of a mixing tool as opposed to a denoising tool kind of interesting. All right, one last question from Greg, um, and this is a good one. And Alan, I'm curious what your thoughts are on this. Um, one more question. Last week I did an interview. In post, I found a ton of constant, very strong, low-frequency rumble, mostly be below 100 hertz, but very strong below 40 hertz. 
I did not detect it well on location. Since then, I've read a couple of recommendations to always run with the high-pass filter engaged on mics for this exact reason. Do you normally have the high-pass filter engaged at the mic? Um, I do not. If I have high-pass filter available on the recording machine, mm-hmm. um, and typically I'm using a, um, you know, some piece of sound devices gear which has very effective uh, high-pass filtering, and I'll set it for typically between, say, 60 and 80 hertz. Mm-hmm. Um, so below, let's say, between 60 and 80 hertz, I will have very little. It'll be like an 18 dB per octave roll-off. Mm-hmm. So it's a fairly good cut. And I've played with this on on male voices. That's where you have to watch it. Make sure you you know, roll it in, roll it out, and listen while the, while the guy talks. Um, I've only had two examples where I could actually hear the uh, sort of bass sound of a, of a male actor um, kind of lose some of its forcefulness, so I had to keep the roll-off down to like 50 mm-hmm. or so. Mm-hmm. The reason I say not at the mic is because I would rather be able to do the variable high-pass filtering at the recorder. You can't do that if, the, if it's engaged at the mic. Mm-hmm. But for those of uh, your audience who do not have um, high-pass filtering or very effective high-pass filtering, if you have a mic that has a low cut, um, I would say you should engage it. Because if you don't, low frequencies can eat up all of your headroom and your recorder. Mm-hmm. Low frequencies, it's funny the way the, the electrical nature of it works, the lower the frequency, the higher the energy uh, content in the electrical signal. So frequencies below 100 hertz can eat up 20 dB of your headroom if you, uh, if you record them. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's useless information for human dialogue there's no information there, so get rid of it, yep. either at the mic or in the recorder. I prefer in the recorder. I agree. And um, that low frequency yeah. he heard, I'm going to guess, came from an air conditioning system. That's a common source of low frequency rumble because the uh, the duct work can resonate. Mm. Mm-hmm. And when the duct work starts flapping, depending on how big the ducts are, typically I'm talking big feeder ducts in a commercial building, it can just like that. Yep. and yep. Just knock it out. Wreak you know. havoc, for sure. A couple of thoughts I have on that as well. Um, get to know your mics. Some mics have very aggressive high-pass filters, in which case um, you may want to be careful about that. Um, another reason to use your recorder or mixer to do the high-pass filtering. Um, for example, I think it was the Sennheiser MKH-50 has a really pretty aggressive um, high-pass filter, and it actually kind of makes a lot of men's voices sound pretty thin. So you'll want to experiment mm. with it up front and just know know what your mic does. Um, second thing, um, the high-pass filters and recorders are not all equal, is what I've found as well. So, for example, in the Tascam units we've been talking about, the DR series, um, even in the Zoom F series, the high-pass filter is implemented in the digital stage. So after all of the audio has already gone through the analog stage, through the preamplifier, and then been converted to digital, then it applies the high-pass filter. And in, and in some of those cases, the damage can already be done. You can have right. already, you know, kind of overwhelmed your preamplifiers. That's why the sound devices is unique, is because it's actually doing that in the analog stage, managing that in the analog stage. Before the preamp. Before the preamp. Exactly. Yeah. And very important, before the preamp, just like a microphone would. So... Mm -hmm. Um, so there's some advantages there just so, you know, just to give that additional contextual information there to make a decision. So, um, Mm -hmm. and then if worse comes to worse, there's always post (laughs) at that point, that's the only choice you have, but that's right. Um, typically in post, they will drop out 40 Hertz and below anyway, Mm -hmm. even if you've already done it, they still do it anyway, because they don't want to deal with it. Exactly. Exactly. And it's a, it's a. It's yeah, I agree. It's it's like a standard plugin that a lot of the post guys will just have in the signal chain automatically, just like a limiter on the output. So, right. So. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our questions, I believe, for today. I do owe one uh, one answer still. We'll get back to that one, and I'll I'll email that individual, and then, um, Alan, this was a lot of fun for me. I hope it was enjoyable for you as well. It was. Yeah, I had a good time. This was great. This is kind of uh, I said before we started rolling a. Uh, 
feel like I'm talking to a celebrity. Well, <laughs> get over that really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good time. Thanks for everyone, uh, everyone for your questions. Those were a lot of good questions. And we'll talk sure. to you again next week. Take care, everybody.